I haven't made a YouTube video for a while. I expected my next one would have been on a different topic, but after finishing Mandalorian Season 3, I honestly have so many thoughts I just needed to format them into something. Firstly, let's just go over what I thought of the first two seasons so you have some context. Spoilers for the whole show by the way. Season 1 was really good. A few bumpy episodes here and there, but mostly a very fresh thing to come out of Star Wars. Very welcome after The Rise of Skywalker. Most episodes followed the same structure, Mando goes somewhere because he needs something, they say only if he does something for them, he does it, gets the thing, and then leaves. It really only deviated at the end when the plot revolved around Grogu, or Baby Yoda as we knew him back then, nearly getting captured by Moff Gideon. However, the structure worked, as each episode's quest was quite engaging, had its own set of characters to follow, as well as some development for Din himself, almost felt similar to the arcs in Clone Wars. Season 2 was similar, but ramped up things a little. We now have an overarching plot of returning Grogu to a Jedi while following the established episode structure, this time with the addition of familiar faces from the Clone Wars and the original trilogy. This was a nice bit of fan service, but importantly it didn't feel forced as each appearance made sense within the story and it was handled organically. The only exception you could claim could be Luke turning up to save the day, but to be honest, I would give them a pass on that one. I mean, logically he would be the Jedi to collect Grogu in this time period, and honestly, isn't it just great to see Luke Skywalker as we expected him to be after Return of the Jedi? The Last Jedi was just a complete character assassination, no matter how well it was written, but that's another topic for another day. Not giving a pass to that CGI or deepfake Luke though. Like, sure it got better, but just recast a lookalike actor, it would look so much less robotic. Anyway. Going into Season 3, I was hopeful but not super confident it was going to be any good. The same team that was behind the last two seasons had since made The Book of Boba Fett, and that was just terrible. I'm quite surprised they decided to release such a show, but either way, they did it, and now here's Mando Season 3. The immediate thing I noticed when watching was the change of direction and structure. Some episodes followed the established episode structure, but for the most part, each episode seems to be doing its own thing. While this in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, it was the overall direction that left me confused. Not only was it a different direction, but sometimes a lack of one. Before, both seasons centred around Din and Grogu, following them growing attached to each other, while also for Din, finding out why Grogu is important and what to do for him. Now, we left off Season 2 with them saying their goodbyes and Grogu reuniting with the Jedi. In Season 3, the two have since been reunited. We'll talk about that later though. But since the show has already wrapped up the story about those two together, there isn't really an obvious direction you can take the story in that revolves around them. I feel the writers knew this and decided on a completely new overarching plot for the season. However, it's not made clear what this plot is until about halfway through the show. The first few episodes just show us some events unfold with its cast of characters with no clear direction of where it's going. At first it seems the goal was to return to Mandalore so Din could take a bath to be redeemed for removing his helmet. Not an amazing goal, but alright. But then we're done with that by the first two episodes, so one quick run in with the Empire and back to camp I guess. Then we have what felt like a bootleg Andor episode following one of the side characters and background characters from the last seasons. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's probably setting up some sort of plot point but we don't revisit the events that happened on Coruscant for the rest of the season, just some nods that tie in with what's happening later in the story. Then we have a clear filler episode that involves rescuing a Mandalorian kid from a dragon, which I don't really see what this episode achieved. The episode did include a flashback for how Grogu survived Order 66, which I will again touch on later, but for now isn't really relevant to anything. And then there is an episode that sees the Mandalorians fight off pirates, which allows them to move house because they were getting eaten a lot on that last planet. Finally in this episode do we learn the goal of the season, which is to unite the Mandalorians Mandalorian factions and retake Mandalore. It took us an awful amount of time to get here. Now I know some people would defend this by saying that there doesn't need to be a clear direction as the whole point for it is to be a mystery, but that's not really the problem here. Mystery is fine, but the first half of the show lacked the feeling of any sort of clear climax possibly on the horizon. It's important for a season of a show to give at least hints of some kind of climax to give the audience a sense of progression with each episode building towards it. I'm not a writer, but I do feel this is a pretty essential when writing a show unless you focus your story around the unpredictability specifically, which is definitely not what they're going for here. Speak of what they're going for, what they are doing is pulling references left, right and centre. There's always a bigger fish. One of the biggest and honestly strangest problems with this season is the quantity and intrusiveness of references. All these references to past Star Wars media are intense and more than simple easter eggs, although there are still plenty of those. The most obvious example is the events that took place in the Book of Boba Fett. This has already been talked about at length online, even before the release of Season 3, but we're now seeing that putting all the important events in the Episode 1 recap does not fix the issue. I've already seen mentions online, and even seen myself, that people who have not watched the Book of Boba Fett are confused why Grogu's now back with Din, or other small things like where his new ship came from 
from. It really was a weird decision to have all these important plot points in a different show that on the surface doesn't even seem related. Then there are all the more minor references like the easter eggs I mentioned. Episode 6 especially had a lot of them like with the droids and the speech Dan Lloyd's character gave about Count Dooku. Poor dude, didn't even know he was Palpatine's puppet. These don't really hurt the show but it does feel a little over the top even if I do like to point to my screen saying I got it, I got it, I knew what they're talking about. Similarly, I do think the sequence of Grogu surviving Order 66 was a bit strange. On the one hand, it was nice to see actually how he was saved, and it was awesome for the Jedi who saved Grogu to be played by Ahmed Best. Dude absolutely deserves the honour. However, I do think the whole choreography of the sequence could have been better. The clones are just kind of standing around, and the Jedi are just kind of walking into the blaster shots. The speeder chase was cool, but this nod was not needed. And look, not a valid point, but if we're going all in on references, why not have Commander Fox with the other cross on guards at the end? And that'd just be neat, you know? However, the minor references certainly were not the main issue. In fact, the show made a much bigger mistake than the Book of Boba Fett tie-in. There were already plenty of references and nods to the Clone Wars and Rebels in previous seasons, but now elements from those shows have become essential plot points. So if you're not familiar with all the details from those shows, or maybe you just don't remember certain elements, you could feel quite lost in the season's story. I mean, let's just take a quick look at what you should know. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, in Clone Wars, Bo-Katan was part of a terrorist group called Death Watch, who believed Mandalore should turn its old warrior ways. Okay, okay. The leader was Pre Vizsla, who wielded the Darksaber, which was originally made by the first and only Mandalorian Jedi, and when he died, it was stolen from the Jedi Temple and used as a symbol of leadership in the Mandalorian culture. Yada, yada, yada. Death Watch decided to team up with the resurrected Darth Maul. They decided to collect all the crime organizations in the Outer Rim to launch a stage attack on Mandalore, where Death Watch can appear as heroes. Yada, yada. Darth Maul betrayed them, won the Darksaber combat. Uh, Bo-Katan wasn't happy, so she did the Siege of Mandalore with the Republic and took over the planet. Uh, did, did, did. The Empire came along, she was knocked out of leadership, and the Mandalorian named Saxon took over. He was later killed by the Mandalorian family called Ren, and the leadership was handed back to Bo-Katan, along with the Darksaber recovered from Maul. And the rest is all told in the last two seasons of Mando, so I hope you remember all the details, right? Yeah? Good. The point I'm trying to make is that they are now alienating probably half or more of their audience. For example, I watched season 3 with my dad. Are you winning, son? who is very much a casual Star Wars fan. As opposed to me, who can identify a blaster by the sound it makes and gets quite upset when the wrong sound effect is used for one. My dad grew up with the original trilogy, wasn't a fan of the prequels, loves Rogue One, and liked Endor and the previous two seasons of Mando. He definitely is not going to watch seven seasons of Clone Wars and four seasons of Rebels. So for him and similar fans, all the important pieces of context are missing, which at best makes the story less enjoyable, but at worst, makes no sense at all. The strangest thing about this though is that the creators behind the show clearly think there is enough there for the audience members who have not seen the animated shows to get what's going on. This is pretty much confirmed by Dave Filoni when he was interviewed about the Ahsoka trailer. Many Rebels characters are appeared in the trailer and he was asked if you need to watch Rebels before watching Ahsoka. Here's the clip. Do you have to have seen Clone Wars to understand Ahsoka? No, you don't have to have seen that. Does it help when you know more and understand more? Sure. So Filoni and likely the rest of the team behind Mando, Ahsoka, etc., think they have done enough to give context when in reality I don't think that's the case. I'm not necessarily against having stories that are interconnected with the animated shows. I like those shows, and I think Ahsoka being a direct follow-up to them, it makes sense that you have to watch those shows before watching Ahsoka. However, The Mandalorian was clearly a hit with both hardcore and casual fans alike. Would it make sense to keep the show in a direction that is new for both audiences so everyone can enjoy it? If not even that, they could have just relied less on what came before to tell this story, and on that point I think they are very clearly telling another story in the background of this season. Let's think back to the original six seasons of Clone Wars. One of the tasks the show kind of had to accomplish was make the prequels work. Even if they're looked on more fondly today, the prequels were very much disliked when they released. And look, let's be honest, they were kind of executed poorly despite their good story and really cool lightsaber fights. I mean, seriously, they're so cool. The Clone Wars helped flesh out that story, the characters, and the world of the prequels, which greatly boosted the films. For example, making Anakin an enjoyable protagonist, fleshing out his character, made his eventual fall to the dark side more believable and tragic. Helping with the world building, humanizing the clones was a great decision that made the original faceless army compelling and made the galaxy feel like it had so many characters that this war was affecting. This sort of approach to the prequel films was a great idea and I think it's now fully obvious that they're doing something like it again. I already thought this in the previous seasons of Mando, but season 3 definitely confirms it. They're trying to make the sequel trilogy work. The Imperial group with a man named Hux, the development of force sensitive clones, and even guards from The Last Jedi, it's very clear that they want to make the sequels feel better connected with the rest of Star Wars. 
And I have quite conflicting feelings on this. I mean, on the one hand, I respect them for trying to make it work, having made one trilogy work better, doing it for the other is a neat idea. However, I also feel they're attempting an impossible task. Like, one of the reasons the Clone Wars was able to do this in the first place was due to the underlying story of the prequels being actually good and quite layered. The sequels, on the other hand, have the opposite problem. They're well executed, apart from episode 9, but the overall story is pretty... Pulling. I mean, the stories were very surface level with no underlying theme to this trilogy and it wasn't connected like at all. You can add context so it feels less jarring, but I'm not quite sure how they are going to achieve this fully. Although I will say it has made me very intrigued what they're going to do next to help accomplish this goal. It'll probably be the main reason I check out the Ahsoka show to see how Thrawn fits into all of this. However, I feel that's part of the problem though. I shouldn't want to watch a show based off what I think they're going to do to make plot points work. It should always be for the intrigue of the characters which brings us neatly into the final section regarding Mando Season 3. The first thing to address here is that Bo-Katan slowly became the protagonist this season instead of Din and Grogu. The excuse for this is probably going to be that the show is called The Mandalorian and she's a Mandalorian so why not? Well, okay, I would prefer the show to continue the established Western style with Din, but if we're going to do it this way, you really need to commit to it. I say this because to me, it seems that having Bo-Katan as the main character was the direction they wanted to go, but were too worried audiences wouldn't like the lack of attention on Din and Grogu. What this creates is a weird middle ground where neither set of protagonists feels as if they're being fleshed out within the season. Focusing on Din and Grogu for now, like I said before, they don't really have a story to tell about them now. The most we've got is this occasional subplot of Din teaching Grogu how to be a Mandalorian, but there aren't enough scenes or struggles to get invested in this. There was also the fact that Grogu got to inhabit the corpse of IG-11 that allowed him to be more active and vocal with his yes and no buttons, but that's as far as that got explored. Honestly, if you removed Grogu from the season entirely, you would need very little rework for the season to play out the same. It makes me wonder whether the decision to reunite Grogu with Din in the Book of Boba Fett was a later decision and they had to change the script to season 3 later in the writing process. There is a good chance he's only still here because he's marketable. As for Din himself, the only character focused storyline we got revolves around him taking the bath of forgiveness or whatever it was called. It wasn't very substantial and after it's done he's kind of just there throughout the rest of the show tagging along with whatever's happening. I can only really think of the scene where he was mean to the droids in episode 6 as anything that felt like more personal. Having no overall development journey for what were your two main characters who still play a predominant role in the story was quite the mistake and loses a lot of investment audiences may have. Moving on to Bo-Katan. This is where they tried to focus their efforts on doing a character arc, but honestly it feels they just failed. From what I can gather, Bo-Katan's story is to gain the confidence to lead the reclamation of Mandalore by accepting and moving on from her past mistakes. The problem is, I really don't feel that this is shown well, as all the scenes that are depicting this personal struggle are heavily inconsistent. For instance, scenes that showed her struggles well were the ones where she was alone with her thoughts and we got to see how she acts. Sitting next to Din unconscious after seeing the Mythosaur, wondering what it meant, or sitting around a campfire alone, feeling the isolation that comes within this cult. Those were some good scenes. However, then you have the ones that were way too direct, a bit of show don't tell going on here. She is very blatant with her thoughts, relaying them to Din both on the pod going to the Mandalorians and then on the Mando pirate ship with, um, skis? Yeah. The problem with these two scenes and throughout the season is that she feels like she only has two emotions, is either getting the job done serious time, or I'm not sure I can do this sad time. There's a real lack of emotional range and insight to who she is as a person and what she's been through, which doesn't really make the character very believable. And that's the thing, if you've seen Clone Wars and Rebels, then you do know what she's been through. Not only is none of this communicated in the show, both for cluing in the audience and displaying how it's affected her, but it reveals that there is plenty of material here to make her very compelling, but it's not utilised properly. You have a character from a royal bloodline who rejected the society she was born into and her sister who followed it, joined a terrorist group to restore the old ways, becoming the leader's number two, then having that leader and the sister you still cared for being slain by a Sith Lord, and that's just in the Clone Wars. It really is a shame that her character was put into the spotlight only for her not to receive the appropriate amount of development to be a compelling protagonist. It is shocking to me that the same show that managed to have us heavily invested in a man that rarely ever shows his face for two seasons didn't manage to have any interesting character stories at all in its third. This season really didn't live up to what came before, it just is such a letdown, just like all the other Disney Plus Star Wars shows. I mean, in what world is a show about Cassian Andor infinitely better than both Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi? Not trying to put Andor down at all, it was amazing, but like seriously. 
And now the Mandalorian season three can just join Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi as media that had so much potential, but it was just so poorly handled. I can't say that I actually hated watching it like I did with the other two shows. It was at least entertaining from a lore perspective, but that really shouldn't carry your show. It should be a bonus. So if you're looking for a good Star Wars show, I say go watch Star Wars Resistance. That's the good stuff. Uh, just kidding. Watch Andor. I'm just assuming Resistance is bad. I haven't watched it, um, but Andor was very good. So go watch that. Bye.